assignment, we may, you know, or you want to do it, it's previously done or you haven't finished it. All the plates and parts for this assignment are kept in this drawer. Also in this drawer, I typically keep the edge finders. Keep them in all in one spot. So if you come here to pick up an edge finder for a project, end of the night we get them back into here. Okay, um, this is where you'll find them. The pointers, all they are is dowel pins we precision ground some points on. So we're probably not going to use those for anything else except for this um, assignment here. So you'll find some of these pointers there. Um, we used to do this project with a wiggler, and wigglers can be very handy. Um, wigglers are, they're just a pointer. You have, you turn on the spindle, and you straighten out the wiggler. When you straighten out a wiggler, you always want to use a scale, a 12 inch scale. I wouldn't use anything less than 12 inch scale, because you want to keep your hands and fingers away from that pointer. Okay, you angle it about 45 degrees when this is spinning. We used to always use it. Um, once you get the pointer going straight, you can turn the spindle off. You don't even need it on anymore. You see some tool makers in shops, when they turn this on, they just go and grab this guy and they just point it straight, okay? And a lot of guys do it, and I guess they got used to it and never had an accident, but there was a demonstration at Cal State Long Beach one time. One of my professors that I went to school, that was there when I was going to school. I wasn't there for this demo, but I only heard about this demo. I forget which doctor it was, doctor somebody. But he needed a doctor after that demonstration, a real doctor. Because what happened was, he went to grab it with his hand and he went to make it go straight. And what happens is, when these guys get kicked past center, and this is a little different brand, but they flip all the way up, it came around and it impaled his finger. Ooh. It went all the way through his finger. Because it, it'll spin on its axes. So it impaled his finger and was spinning on the axes right in the middle of his demo. So anyways, don't mess with these things. Okay, if you, and they are handy. Um, you can get them going nice and straight. I've had some dies and stuff I've done at my shop where I had to basically crawl on the table with my hand wheel and indicate a certain little feature and pick it up, compare it to another one to line up dies and stuff like that. Sometimes you don't have real clear indicating points on tools and stuff, so you can use them for all sorts of things. But just be careful with them. They are a sharp point, and they, you know, they will once they go off center. Okay, they they can do a whole lot of damage. Okay. All right. So we keep that stuff in here. Um, here's a couple stereo that this is all the, your parts of an edge finder and we had a couple stereo recently just totally I had one come apart right in the middle of a demo right in the middle of the demo I do for this it came apart um, and they've been falling apart recently so I don't know what they're doing what they changed in their manufacturing process but they used to be really good and consistent they're not so good and consistent anymore but basically let's see here I can't even get this hooked up again this little tab here, no. Anyway, the spring connects between the back of this here, connects to your edge finder. Okay, and what you got is a precision lap surface between these two. And you should, it should feel smooth. Okay, for example, let's see, here's a couple edge finders. That one feels pretty good. Try to find one. That one feels pretty fresh right there. See if we have one that's been damaged. That one feels good. That's not a stair. I don't know what that is, but it feels pretty good. And, uh, you might even find a stair that doesn't feel very good. This one here, now just realize we are at school. Mistakes happen. Every semester I expect to lose a couple of these. Okay, so if you break an edge finder, it's not the end of the world. Just let me know. We'll replace it. Okay, we lose a couple every semester. So but what happens a lot of times, this one's already been kind of tweaked a little bit. You come too far and as it's spinning, you go and you give it too much pressure. It might spin like that. Well, what happens when it spins like that, that precision lap surface starts getting a little bit burred up and stuff. And so this one, you'll feel it. This one doesn't feel so smooth anymore. So I wouldn't even want to use that one, okay? And these are indicating tools when you're at work and something happens to your edge finder like that you're better off just throwing that stuff away. Getting rid of it and always having good tools. Because you're indicating parts sometimes that are thousands and thousands of dollars. I, I, we do tool and die work at our shop and you know sometimes the die that I have is literally a $150,000 die that I'm indicating. So I don't want to you know cut corners on an indicating tool that's not not working that well. Okay?
All right, so that's where this stuff is. I think we have enough stuff over there, but I'll go ahead and bring this over there anyway because this is where you're going to want it. So we're going to head over there to the machine. Alright, first thing we want to do is before you even put this in there is make sure you check the vise. Make sure the vise is square. Okay, because we are still doing our vise indicating. Um, I think someone finished this one up this morning, but still again, we should check it. Restart. Alright, so the vise is indicated. Okay, and someone's got it tight. I just check with my fingers. We're not going to be doing any cutting on it, so they don't need to be super tight. Alright, so we, now we've taken care of that. We know the vise for sure is taken care of. Now these are parallel. These are called parallels. And they're just precision ground pieces of steel. Um, the ones we use for the CNC projects, we don't mix these up with the ones for the Okay, we keep these, they, they go in the second drawer of that toolbox right over there. Okay, in the class we'll get them put back there. Um, when you pick up the parallels, you want to make sure the pairs are matched because if you don't the way right, you might have... See, this one here is actually, this is when it says D1 in the game. That means it came from D1. So this really should not be in this set. So, anyway. But you always want to make sure they're matched because I have, I've seen, of course, you know, people here don't have a lot of I've seen students literally try to use a parallel like that and a parallel like that to try to do this exercise or put a part on it. It's like, it doesn't work that way. Anyway. Right, there, so these plates are kind of beat up. Good enough. That's a new one. That's a new one from this morning right there. Look at that. Did that one this morning. <laughs> oh snaps. That's a fresh one. Alright. Put that on there. Oh, one right there? Oh, thank you. Didn't see that. Alright, so now we gotta get the tool over ready. Okay? So types of tool holders we use. We, these are called CAT 40 tool holders. Okay? This side here is where we keep all the Haas tool holders. Okay? That side there is where we keep all the Perco tool holders. Now, they both use CAT 40 tool holders. But the exception is they have different retention oh, lines. Can somebody grab me a tool holder from that drawer right there? Go ahead and pull out any tool holder there. That's fine. All right, so notice the difference? It's the same exact holder. If I pull this retention knob off, and they do come right off, and I swap it with this one, I can use this in this machine. Okay, so we can kind of move the tool holders around, but this retention knob works on Herco's, works on Fidel's, I think it works on Mazak. I don't want to find out what happens when this gets into the hoss. This could possibly do damage to the retention clamp that's in there. Okay, and vice versa. I don't want to find out when the Haas tool gets into the Herco. Okay, so we try to keep only Herco tools there, only Haas tools there. Okay, so try to keep mindful of that. Okay. Um, the types of collar holders we use, we use what's called um, EAR, ER collets. 
from K. Erickson, ER32 collets, ER16 collets. You should have all the collets right here in the drawer. Okay. With this type of collet, first thing I'm going to do is show you how to ruin the collet. Okay. And how to ruin your collet. And it's pretty innocent. Looks like I'm doing nothing wrong, right? Now this one would require a special wrench. It's already kind of sensed up in there a little bit. Uh, this uses a little cog to wrench right here. Okay. Now here's the problem. That will ruin that collet. Because this type of collet, see that groove it has right there? Whenever you see a groove in a collet, that means it has a, re a little retention clip inside the collet net that it has to lock into. Okay? Because what happens in the collet, this here is a precision ground surface. This here is a precision ground surface. On your collet nut, there is also a precision ground surface that has to be mated up at the top of this. There is a retention ring that's in there that you have to snap this guy into. See that? Now it's properly put in there. Okay. Now it will properly work. Okay. There's this type of collet system. Um, there's also what's called the double angle type of collet system. And if someone can open the very bottom drawer on that, that box and pull me out one of the holders that's closest to the front of the drawer. Any one of those. Perfect. Yep, that one right there. Perfect. Thank you. This is called a DA collet. This is a double angle collet. So the double angle collet has no groove in it. Okay, this is a very simplistic collet. These hold a little bit better. Okay, so a lot of times shops will prefer the ER collets. Some don't want to mess with the little snap ring, so they buy these. These, it simply compresses against this angle there and that angle there and smushes it together. Well, with these here, you're really only getting the gripping force in the very top of your tool. Okay, versus the ER collet, Where you're getting the gripping force really more evenly and more distributed across the tool. So you're getting a better grip on the tool. Okay? And they make another call called the TG call, they're even longer, and you even get a better grip on the tool. So you can run end mills in these if you're doing finish cuts and stuff. Um, you still gotta take it easy on end mills. It's really only for finish cuts. Um, but anyway. I'm snap this guy in there. Sometimes they don't snap. There's a little eccentric circle. You drop it and push it over. It all depends upon the manufacturer, how they made them. Um, so with the machining, everything's got to be clean. Okay. So whenever I put these together, I make sure there's no chips in here. Okay. I make sure things are very clean. One little chip in here, one little chip in between the collet and that um, the collet nut precision ground surface, and it will force your tool to run out a little bit. Okay. So it's very important to keep things clean. When you tighten things up on these collets, normally you use this wrench if you're going to be like running a drill or running an end mill. But being that we're just doing indicating, okay, for you guys, just by hand is perfectly fine. That's good. Okay, that's not good enough to machine with. But the nice thing about doing it by hand is, if you make a mistake and you go Z instead of X and Y, more than likely, it's just going to slide that tool up inside the collar a little bit. It's not going to be a blunt force. If you tightened it, it might be a blunt force. And instead of just pushing that guy up, it may overload, overload the Z-axis amplifier and cause him to blow it out, which is about a $2,000 oh crap moment. Okay? All right, so now we're going to put the tool in the, the spindle. So when I put the tool in the spindle, if you'll notice on the machine, there's these clocking lugs. There's a little, little gap for the clocking lugs. There's always one side that has more space than the other. Okay? On a lot of machines, it matters how these go into the spindle. In okay, the Haas, it doesn't, but I always try to make you think about it. Because if you get on a Makino, it will. Okay? Herco, it does. 
Herco's got a little tab built into the spindle. You can't even put it in there. It'll actually, you can't even push it up until you flip it around the right way. So it's got kind of a, a built-in safety. Some of your Japanese machines do not have that. Now, on the Haas, you'll notice that we have two clocking lugs right here. Our driving lugs, clocking lugs. Which is the right one to put it into? Well, normally when you load these into the spindle, you want the side of the tool holder with the most clearance pointing to the inside of the turret. So we got to get that clocking lug okay, into that position. How do you think I do that? It was an M code on your quiz. Orientation. If you have a FANUC machine, you would go to MDI. And there's a command in there, I'm going to erase it. You are going to be doing some MDI commands. I would say M19. I would say in the block. I would insert it. I close my door. You can't do an MDI command with the door open. Second like start, and you're going to see that guy go, it's going to flip around. Not a way to. Okay? And then you can put the tool in. Now, the nice thing about the Haas, it's got some really cool one button features. Under MDI, press spindle, I don't know if it'll do it again because it's there. Wait or reset. Why is it telling me that? It's not working. I'll make it. M3, S1000, in the block, insert, we'll say to close the door. And now the Haas, what? Spindle orientate. Okay. All right. So when you put in the tool, Side the most clearance to the inside of the turret. Do not hold it here, okay? Because good chance this will pinch you and give you a blood blister of a lifetime here. You don't want that. Yeah. Always get below it, okay? The Haas, most of our Haas have a button right up here on the head. If there is a tool in the spindle, the moment I press that, it's going to let go of the tool. And if you're not hanging on to it, it will bounce it off the table, okay? That's in there properly, and I've done this a lot of times, so I'm pretty quick at it. And you do put the tool in. Instead of trying to line it up the first time and get it right, I purposely will be off. And that way I can rotate it and feel where it drops in, and then I let it go in. Okay? Now the hosses, have a little bigger gap from the tool holder flange to spindle than most machines. And they, they do this, it allows you to re-grind the taper of the spindle. That's something I didn't really go over because I went over this morning. I'll go over that again. So getting to more about the precision of your tool holders. This taper is everything. This is the precision of your, of your operation. Do you have any mix on this? The tool holder is going to run out. I want to make sure this is always clean. If it does have a nick, you can usually get a little hand grinding stone and stone off anything. Other thing you want to watch out for is in the inside the machine. You always want to make sure this taper is clean. This should be maintained on a regular basis. Okay, we have wiper tools for cleaning it. We even have wiper tools where you can purchase a rubberized abrasive blades. And if you have some damage in there, you can kind of hand finish it up. Um, and get any mixed and burrs out of there. If it gets bad enough, it's very, you, if it gets bad enough, you have to have a regrind. And there is a service that will come out to your shop. It will set a grinding fixture up right on your table and it will regrind that tape. Okay? Now, if you take care of your machine and you're very meticulous about your machine, you will never need that service. So many shops out there are not very meticulous. They're kind of sloppy. They don't pay attention to things. Plus, if you're running production, chips get on your tools, and they get transferred up into there, and then it scraps your parts, and all sorts of bad things happen. The taper gets messed up. So 
nice thing to know there is a service that will come out and can refresh stuff. Um, when I go look at used machines, that's one of the first things I'll do. I'll feel inside of there. If I notice it's got a lot of nicks, let's say they're, they want you know fifty thousand bucks for a machine, I'll say, well, geez, that's gonna cost me a couple thousand bucks to get it reground. That's, that's a bargaining chip right there. Okay. So, all right. Now it will hold the tool. If you don't clock it, that's bad to do. I hate doing this, but I do it always in a demo. Okay? Just the first demo, because I'm sure it's not good on the clamping device. Now, that gap is extra big. See that? The clogging lugs are not lined up. Also, when it goes to put this tool away, the tool changer, it's not lined up. So it's going to cause all sorts of problems. Okay? Whatever you do, do not ever take your finger and go, that gap looks kind of big. Because many times, and I've seen this, students put a tool, tool in, and they're right at the edge of that corner, and it's like almost ready to pull it up. And at some point, I've seen them go, thump, and it pulls it up. Okay, so if your finger is there, it's going to get squashed. Okay, so don't need to do that. All right, so let's go ahead and put this in there. The right way, once and for all. All right, that's good there. Okay, so now I'm going to override the door hole so we can see. If I don't override the door hole, it's going to be really hard to see through this, this door. Here. Okay, so on the older hosses, you can do this. On the newer hosses, you can't do this. Door hole override on, right enter. That's going to allow me to go to MDI and turn the spindle on at 1,000 RPM. Okay? You guys are going to need to give the machine some MDI commands. Spindle on. Okay? One of the reasons why you have to do this is that, let's say there's nothing in there at all. I'm going to hit a race program and it gets rid of my little program. Well, if the machine was doing some engraving prior to this, it could have been engraving at the max RPM of the machine, 6,000 RPM. Okay? What do you think 6,000, 10,000 RPM does to one of these guys? We they, they become projectiles. Yep, they blow up. This comes off, the spring goes here, they fall apart. Okay? So we want to make 100% sure that we're not going 10,000 RPM. So I'm going to go M3, S1000, in the block, which is right there. And on a FedEx machine, you have to go insert. The hoss, you can use the right enter. While you I'll stick the pen up. I'll double check it, make sure I didn't put an extra zero in there. And I will cycle start. Whenever you do an MBI command, you should always be ready to stop it. So there we go. Our spindle is on at 1,000 RPM. Okay? So now what I want to do is get my position system. We'll go to position. Right now when I go to position, it's showing me, it's showing me the four different coordinates. I want to page up. So I get the position operator. That's the only one I can change. Watch. If I try to change position machine, X origin, nothing happens. Okay? If I go to position work and I try to do X, and X is already there, origin, nothing happens. If I go to position operator and I go X origin, it zeroes the X. Okay? I can also hard load a number. For example, the radius of the edge finder is 100 thousandths, right? X.1 origin. I can enter that. Okay? All right, so I'm going to handle job. Increment is 0 0.01. Always look at the keyboard, make sure to check the increment. It does not matter if you do X first or if you do. Y first. You get it close, and I'm gonna try to stand back. It's gonna be hard for me to. I'm gonna get out of the way. See if I can do it from a, a far away. Okay. Okay. I got it at one thousandths per pulse, so I've got it slowed down. I'm probably gonna have to get in closer to see it. 
It is off. Oh yeah, it already went. Alright, I'm going to have to do this. Alright, it moved off a little bit. So right now I'm setting an X minus 0.1. I can enter X minus point one. I can press origin. Now this is strictly for operator reference. Now once you get the number, you might want to go back and double check it. Okay, this time I'm going to get in a little closer. Get it right there, minus one twenty one. <laughs> Wow, it's off block. I'm gonna go down and fly a little more. Go down a little bit. See if I can get it to react a little bit more. That's much better. Now the problem is the ice blender, it's going straight back. So for you guys to see it is really good. And you're really only going to see it, and you ever need to see it for themselves, okay? But as you're doing it, you'll see it. So I just got my number to repeat within 1,000, so it should be pretty close, okay? So I'm going to, that X is fine, I'm going to go through the Y now. So I'm going to move off. These videos Dimitri's doing, I'm, we're trying to set up a YouTube channel. I have one set up. So once we get some of these videos on there, we're going to post some of these. So if you want to review them, you can see the option. So. Alright. And sometimes I'm going to just feed in kind of quick. I know that's not the position, but I that gets me real close in a hurry. I'm going to back <laughs> off. Now I'm going to go slower. 1,000 cents on. I think this is going to show a lot better. That one showed really good. So that one kicked to the left really nicely. Okay? So there I'm going to say Y. Now I'm still, in this case, the minus coordinate. Minus point one origin. And you should always, especially you guys, go back and double check it. Make sure you get a repeatable number. Without a repeatable number, you, you, don't, you don't got it. Okay, need to repeat within about a thousand. Okay? Thousands or two. Ten away. Now we're getting real close. Four, three, two, one. Right there. Yep, repeat it perfect. Okay? Alright, so now we know we got a repeatable number. Now what you want to do is take the spindle up above the part, take the Y to zero. Bar. Take the X to zero. Now before you take this tool out, you might want to kind of take a moment and look at it and see if it looks like you're about centered. I'm about centered on X, yes? You're going to have to stick your head in there and look down the x-axis to see if the y looks about right. Okay? Does the y look about right? Yes. Okay? So now I know I've got the corner indicated within about a thousandth of an inch. Okay? So now we're going to change tools. So the nice thing about just hand doing these tools, you now you can pull this tool out and change it, put a pointer in, or you just unscrew it, take this out. Point. There you go. Again, we're not machining with it. As long as it holds it, it's in there. It actually loose is good in case you make a mistake. Okay? Alright. And if you want to change it, feel free to change it. The more experience you guys get changing tools and stuff, the better. So now what you're going to do is bring this down to the corner.
you don't need to get it right into the points and stuff like that. If you get it like a hundred thousand above or two thousand above, if you do want to make sure you know where the Z is at so you can come back to it, you can just say Z origin. Now if I raise it up, as long as I don't move the tool, it comes back to the same exact position. But what you're going to do is you're going to simply jog over. I would like to see you guys go to at least to the third place 1,000 when you do this. Get it close, slow it down. And just by eye, try to put it in there. Okay, record your number. Doesn't have to be perfect. Obviously, we threw away all the precision when we put a point in there and we did eyeball. Some more of a jogging exercise. So, when you do this absolute, you're going to indicate your number and you're going to proceed through. Write this number down. Always move slow first, and then you can speed up. There's been many a time, especially in a noisy machine shop, that I think I'm in X, and I go to crank it, and it's like, oh, I'm going all the way. Many a time. Okay. The nice thing about the mark I have said I can get back to it. So you're going to indicate the next position. Go to a thousand, try to get it a little close, record it. You're going to do them all in absolute. Okay? And then after you get them all done in absolute, you're going to go back. If you wanted to go back to your first coordinate, you can. Go back to your first coordinate. It's going to be the same really from the origin of the first one, right? 